sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. BBC Five Live. Different with Nicky Campbell. Hello, welcome to Different, the podcast where we delve into lives extraordinary. This week, my guest is Katie Morgan Davis, one of the most remarkable women I have ever met. Katie was born in a small communist Maoist cult in London. Her father was the cult leader, Aravindan Balakrishnan, or AB, and her mother was one of his followers, although Katie didn't know they were her parents until adulthood. I used to think, in here it's meant to be really good and safe and happy, but it's not. Out there looks a lot better than what's in here. Katie was raised in isolation, confined in the house, not allowed to go to school or leave at all even forbidden from looking out of the window. I was never allowed to be in a room on my own, but sometimes there was just one person there, and that was when I used to steal glances out of the window. In 2013, at 30 years old, she escaped, along with two other cult members, with the help of the Freedom Charity. And in 2016, her father was sent to prison for 23 years for child cruelty, false imprisonment, rape, indecent assault and assault. He died in prison. I think that he kept me a prisoner, but by so doing, he was keeping himself a prisoner too. Before we go on, I should say that this episode contains descriptions of abuse and violence, which some listeners may find upsetting. Tell me about the first 30 years you were in your own prison. Um, well, my earliest memories were of aggression and violence around me, and there was a there was always an extremely unpleasant atmosphere where I grew up. And it was like you never knew what was going to happen next. So it all kind of hinged on the moods of the people around somebody was in a good mood everything was kind of okay but you never knew when that would change you talk about the mood of your who you found out later was your father yeah. the mood of who you found out later was your mother or the mood yeah. of others mainly your father well mainly my father he kind of determined the mood of everyone else but there was also a lot of other things going on and just for him to take all the blame I do not think was fair because a lot of the time there was a lot of jealousy among the many of the cult members and what I used to see as a child it was horrific I used to have people they used to kind of take turns to be the outcast so one cult member would be the outcast this week and everyone else would be teaming up to throw mud at that person, to tell tales about that person, to make that person's transgressions look a lot worse than they actually were. And that person would be isolated, no one would talk to them and they would be treated like... That's an interesting word, transgressions. Mm. It's, it's the kind of Leninist, Marxist, Maoist collective word, isn't it? Yeah. Your transgressions. Yep. You must atone for your transgressions. That's right. This is where we get the similarity between this type of belief system and, and religions is because it's a quasi yeah. religion. It's it job. was, it was definitely a religion, but without the forgiveness, let's say. It wow. was just just the doctrine, just the ideology, just the punishment of the heretic, but there was no coming back. At that time, there was the man who you found out later is was your father. Mm. And how many women? When I was a child, there were, well, there was my mum, there was my stepmother, who was his wife, and her sister, and then there were six others, 
but I don't remember some of them because they they left when I was small. But I knew that I was told that they were there. How many was he sleeping with or having sex? With? Uh, I do not know. I really do not know. I didn't. I didn't know anything about that. But I knew that there was a lot of jealousy between the women. And as as I grew older, I kind of read between the lines, Did you? Yeah. and I could see that there was. If one had more opportunity, then the other one would be angry about it and try to bring that person down. So it was like everybody wanted to be number one. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there used to be this, that people would be banished for a period of time. And then, a week or two later, that person would take revenge. And then the person who had originally reported the transgression would now become the the person who had transgressed. This is Maoism, this is the cultural is. revolution in China, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, it is. And unfortunately I see some of that happening today with all this, um, it horrifies me honestly when you see like cancel culture, you know when they're like mm. targeting someone for saying something wrong. Pylons. Pylons, and they go right into someone's past, something they said 20 years ago would be used against them as if as if we don't want to make mistakes denounced denounced is, yes is the word, and it? then no one will employ them no one will want to be seen in their company because they are they are the heretic they have you're not allowed to change you're not allowed to change you're not, there's yeah. no rehabilitation there's no forgiveness and i think it's i think it's that to me is the most evil thing that I saw growing up and unfortunately I see it out here as well and that really upsets me honestly just to see similarities between the cult that you were a captive of and the world at large that's so interesting yeah did anyone hold you and cuddle you and love you no not really I, I used to steal hugs from some of the cult members behind the scenes. Aisha was quite gentle and kind, if she could be, but if she was caught, then she'd turn on me. So you couldn't trust anybody in there, really. Only up to a point. Tell me about stealing hugs behind the scenes. You're a little girl. Yeah. And I tried to cuddle up with somebody, and sometimes it was allowed, and other times I would get reported for doing that and then get beaten up for 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 what for hugging someone or showing affection because affection was not allowed affection was seen as a weakness. bourgeois yeah bourgeois and lesbian and all sorts of things like that it was like we shouldn't there should be no touching there should be no no basically there should be no connection except with the cult leader so each person was not allowed to connect with each other is a typical cult setting where your only affection was for the cult leader and that was all that was allowed and also because of the jealousy then nobody really wanted to be affectionate to each other I mean except me I wasn't part of that but I mean they were jealous of me because I was I don't know because I was a child and and how old would you have been I think I was, I remember doing it, not when I was very small, but maybe when I was seven or eight, and later on, and then after my mum passed away, I used to steal a few more hugs, and I did get a few hugs, but I remember an occasion when I was hugging O, and Josie, one of the other cult members, came in, and she reported us, because after after my mum went to hospital. I mean, I didn't I didn't know she was my mum and I had no affection for her, but because she had been horrible to me, but seeing her falling out of the window and all the blood, it was quite horrendous. And O was comforting me and we got reported for that. Was she murdered? No, I won't say she was, but I would say she was driven to it because she was 
persecuted there, and I kind of could see why <coughs> she felt the way she did, but it was also hard to be on the receiving end of it, if that makes sense. Complete sense. So let's talk about the, the I mean, there's more to explore there, mm. but let's talk about the credo, just so that we get it all in, in context here. Yeah. The, the belief, because this was the, the Workers' Institute of Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought. Yes. The collective, preparing the country for the takeover of China. Yeah. yeah. And what they said, yeah. And there was a split from other communist movements because this movement moved into kind of mystical stuff a little bit. Yes, but even before they moved into the mystical domain, they were seen as extreme. They used to be, even by other left-wing groups, they used to be called the most lunatic of the lunatic fringe and things like that. And I remember growing up hearing the cult members repeating that with pride, that we are the most lunatic of the lunatic fringe. The truest of the true. Yeah. And they... I, I do not know how they managed to act in the way they did, but when I look back on it now, to me it just seems like one person with severe delusions and others not being able to challenge that. I think, I do think that my father needed help. I think if he had been in a place where people did not go along with him, I don't think he could have perpetuated the kind of thing that he did. He was very much a group, very much a, a group action, all the things that were going on. It wasn't just one person because each one of them, including my dad and the others, they were all right on their own. They could be all right. Could he be all right? Your da dad's yes. quite an affectionate word and you say mum as well for a woman who is yeah. very cruel to you, but um, I know. maybe it's just for want of a d better word. Want of a better word. <laughs> um, so, could, could he be nice? Well, he could be affectionate, if you did as he said, basically, or if he was in a good mood. And sometimes when, well, this was more, not so much when I was a child, but later on, when I was on my own with him, sometimes I thought, you know, we could actually have a good father-daughter relationship if it wasn't for this ideology because sometimes he was nice and I got along with him. What's nice? Like we would talk about things and he would sort of see things from my perspective sometimes, maybe once a year. <laughs> and... Can you give me an example of a conversation? Um, I would, when I was sort of in my early 20s, my late teens and early 20s, I used to complain about being kept in the house all the time and not having more freedom and he would say yeah I can I can see why you feel that way but there's a reason for it and he never always never actually gave her what was the reason that you were kept in the house or was it? well I was told that it was to protect me from the fascist state so it was like at one point he would say, I can kind of understand it and I'll work something out, you know, like as if he almost wanted there to be a way out of it. And then others would remind him that he was betraying his principles by doing that. And they would remind him of all the things that I had done, which went against his authority. And then he would turn back and say, yeah, that's why I keep her here. So... What happened? How did you feel when you looked out the window? upstairs window did you when, you when I was a child I I was not meant to look out of the window I was told I was not allowed and that was punished if it was if I was caught what happened if you were caught but, oh I would get beaten up usually or somebody would have to stand and watch me all the time I wasn't allowed to kind of I, I was never allowed to be in a room on my own but sometimes there was just one person there and they would sort of sometimes look the other way or do something and that was when I used to steal glances out of the window much like I used to steal hugs but what what I used to see I always thought looked a lot nicer than where I was coming where I came from because they used to say 
that was all bad out there. Outside was dangerous, outside was bad, outside was full of predators, people just waiting to do harm to you. Fascists. Fascists. Mm. This thing, that thing. In here is safe. And then, but then I used to think, in here is meant to be really good and safe and happy, but it's not. Out there looks a lot better than what's in here. So it was it was almost like what they were saying and reality didn't get along. Were you ever with another child? Did you ever No. No. There were no other children. Did you see any children out the window when you looked? I used to see children playing and sometimes there was someone had a birthday party and I used to think, why can't I have that? Why can't I have something that was fun? Why did we have to behave like soldiers? It was like an army barracks. Everything, even every word you said had to be the right speak. If you know, you had to say things in a particular way. And you couldn't just talk about what you were interested in. You had to talk in a certain way. And it, it was so freaky. Everything had to be through this lens of, you know, and they say like the personal is political. That is, that was taken to the extreme in the cult. Everything was political. There was no, you couldn't say, oh, I like the way you dress. That was, that was reactionary. That was bourgeois. So you had to dress, everybody dressed like, you know, like in China, how the red guards dressed, you know, all boring, plain colors. They all looked like almost camouflaged into the background that was kind of how I was meant to dress as a child I hated it absolutely hated it let's look at the politics a little bit so mm. um, the personal is the political mm. and the stuff he believed the stuff you all were well I assumed believed and you didn't know any better because you didn't have any reference points no I, yeah, I didn't know any better but I always disliked it even though I was told this was right and they used to, I remember them saying to me, the other cult members, they would say things like, you may not realize why it's right, but you just follow it and in time you will understand. And it was like, I used to tell myself, there must be something wrong with me because I do not like this. I do not like this constant aggression. I do not like everything being seen through this hard, cruel, sort of puritanical lens, I want to your, be able to think freely. Your, your childhood was stolen from me. Your first 30 yes. years were stolen from yeah. me. I'm sitting here speaking to a woman who's remarkable. I mean, I don't know, beneath the surface. Obviously, we all have stuff beneath the surface, but mm. you seem to be incredibly together, given what you went through. Yes, well, I think that a lot of that is to do with the reading that I did. I did a lot of secret reading that was not meant to do, and that kept me sane. Who taught you to read? I can't remember. It was... I don't remember a time when I wasn't reading. It was... That was the greatest gift to me, I think, teaching me to read and write. What did you read that you thought, oh my goodness me, that's amazing? Um... Well... This was later on, this was not my earliest memory, but I read The Lord of the Rings, and that was absolutely the most amazing thing I've ever read. Transformative, was it? Absolutely, and it it really, it kind of, um, I don't know how to say this exactly, but it, it was like I, that's how I already thought in that way, and The Lord of the Rings kind of made me think, yeah, that is the right way to be, to, um, to be kind, to be forgiving, to not to desire power or to control others. And I remember the reason that I was allowed to read that book was because my dad identified with Aragorn because his name was Aravindan and he said, Aragorn, was the king in exile, like himself. He thought he was the king in exile, who was going to rule the world. And that's why I was allowed to read the book. But when I read the book, I thought to myself, 
you don't sound like Aragorn at all, you sound like Sauron. And you want all of us to be like black riders, you know, who don't have any sense of self, don't have any will except that of their master. So you're not allowed to have your own preferences, you're not allowed to think the way you do. You have to think as you are told to think. You have to like what you are told to like. You can't even like food or clothes or music without being without referring to what your master tells you to like. So if you like something and he says that's not good, then you have to stop liking it and like what he says is the right so thing that was to your, like. that was your moral framework, The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, well, pre even before that, I kind of read things which challenged what was being t what I had been told. Do you think, here's an, here's a, an off being question. Yeah. Um, and it comes from something that Christopher Hitchens once said. There's more truth in Dickens and, and Proust, and I think he mentioned another couple of books, than there is in the whole, all the Holy Scriptures. You're nodding. Do you th I agree with that. Do you think that if the Lord of the Rings in a parallel universe mm -hmm. had been the Holy Scripture, rather than the, of the monotheistic world or whatever, mm. rather than the crown of the Torah or the Bible. Yeah. This would be a better world? Definitely, that? it would be the best world. It, it, and I, Tolkien was Christian, he was a Catholic, but he, I think, I'm not anti-religion, because I think there's a lot of beauty in religion, especially in the Christian religion about forgiveness and mercy and grace. I think that is very good, you know, love your, love thy neighbour, love thine enemy, I love all that and I think that we need more, much more of that. What we don't need is the, you go to hell if you don't do this and all that hard, uncompromising doctrine, you don't need that. And Tolkien kind of left that bad bit out and put the good bit in and I think that really had a great impact on me about how how, how we should live. How often do you read it? Oh, at least once a year. Mm. And I watch the films as well. If ever I'm feeling low in mood or I'm poorly, I'm back to Lord of the Rings, always. And it's, it's the best thing ever written, I would say. So the philosophy, the politics of this, mm. You refer to him as your dad. I feel uncomfortable with that. Word. Yeah. But um, Balakrishnan, right, he convinced his followers everything was controlled by him. Yeah. The sun, the moon, wind, fires, he could overthrow governments, control natural disasters. Yeah. He had the power of life and death. Yes. Um, and during his trial, he was the only defense witness and told jurors that a challenge to his leadership resulted in the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep. When you hear that now, do you, do you laugh or do you cry? I laugh. But it just shows how delusions go. If you do not check them, I think anyone, or well, almost anyone, could get to that position if you do, do not if you have no self-awareness and you don't check yourself. There's no one to check you. No one to check you and you're surrounded by people who say everything you say is right, even when it's wrong. I'm not surprised he created his own prison, actually. In some ways, I think that he kept me a prisoner, but by so doing, he was keeping himself a prisoner too, in that situation, because there were glimpses of who he could have been if he didn't live in this situation, if he didn't create this kind of weird... Give me a glimpse. A glimpse. Give me one of those glimpses. Um, well, I remember when I was 10 years old, we moved to Wembley and we were living in a majority Indian community. and. I noticed they were a lot nicer, my dad, my stepmother, they were a lot nicer because living in that Indian community and they were listening to Indian music, they used to go out to watch Hindi films and 
it they reconnected with who they were before they joined or created or became part of this weird ideology and you could see there was another side to them but it was like they had fed that bad wolf so much that it just guarded the gates all the time they did not allow the other part of themselves to flourish and where possible I tried to connect with that part of them but it wasn't it was sometimes it worked for a short time but never long enough to make any lasting change this is the forgiveness of the Lord of the Rings mm. about Gollum there was this character of Gollum who had he had a two sides he had one part of him which wanted the light but it was almost like he was so familiar with the darkness that he was scared of the light he wanted it but he was scared of it so he felt the comfort in the darkness is that your father when i read that i thought that sounds like my father and sounds like these people in the house around me it was like they yearned for something else but they just didn't know how to how to reach that who was the first person you loved then i think aisha i did love aisha i still love aisha she's a, she's a good person is there any love for your father um i don't know um i suppose i feel a sense of loss for what he could have been if he hadn't got involved in this ideology he could have been a different person I mean any one of us have got so many choices to make as we walk through our lives we could do one thing or we could do another and sometimes you don't know what is the best way to do it but you have to I think you have to have a kind of guiding light and for me personally my guiding light is don't be cruel don't don't impose upon others don't seek power again the i think you're the most incredible from, survivor of ever met given what you went through well, thank you. Years. that's all down to my reading if i didn't read i would have become someone very different and like i was mentioning about the two wolves while while I was trying to feed the good wolf in them, they were trying their hardest to feed the bad wolf in me. And as time was going on, I just felt myself becoming like them against my will. I was becoming angry with them all the time. Because of the situation, it was making me extremely angry. And I don't want to be angry. And then I started becoming nasty and being horrible to people around me. And that really made me feel disgusted with myself. Let me, yeah. let me um, ask you about Jackie. Yeah. This is not another woman who lived in the collective. No. Tell me about Jackie. Jackie was, um, it was meant to be a mind control machine. His original name was The Machines when I grew up as a kid and then he had many different avatars for want of a better word until he finally became Jackie so he was invisible but he could control the minds of everyone and he could make he was the one who was responsible for all the natural disasters in the world and like the Challenger shuttle disaster that we mentioned that was Jackie and if someone disagreed with my dad, Jackie would punish us. That was what I was told. And like when I used to get beaten up as a child or when the other members of the cult got beaten up, we were told that we were actually being, we were actually lucky that AB was doing us a service because if it was left to Jackie he would torture us to death so the fact that AB beat us up my father. and my father beat us up made us 
less guilty in the eyes of Jackie and he he did chose not to punish us so hard because he felt that his master had punished us as much as was deserved. So it was like that's what I grew up being told that I should be thankful for getting treated like this because I was so bad that I deserved to burn in hell basically and it was almost like a form of redemption being beaten up. He died two years ago, didn't he? He did, yes. Um, last year, last actually. Year. April last year. April last year. What were your feelings when you heard? Well, I... In prison? I, yes, but I, well, the feelings that, again, what I said earlier, there was this sense of loss for who he could have been. And did I... Did you cry? I don't think I. I don't think I cry. I don't remember crying. But did you feel I feel sad. I. I think I did feel sad that we were not able to reconcile because I didn't want to leave it. That I wanted to be free, but I didn't want to be an enemy with him. You know, I didn't want to consider. I didn't consider him an enemy. Did you not want an apology for having your life stolen well, from you? Well, yes, I would have loved that, but I knew he was not. He had not reached that place to be able to give that apology. Get in the mood for a new podcast. Murder, they wrote. Hey, I'm Nora Whitmore. And I'm Ian Sterling. Now, anyone who knows us knows we are obsessed with true crime. We're here with a new podcast exploring the dastardly deeds of history's most atrocious criminals. There'll be mystery, madness, and moments of... Oh, my God. Murder, they wrote with Nora Whitmore and Ian Sterling. Listen on BBC Sounds. So, Jackie, the invisible mind control machine... Um, Jackie, it's an acronym, was it Jehovah, Allah, Christ, Krishna? Immortal Iswaran, yes. Yeah, right. Um, did, did you doubt it at any stage yourself? Did you think at any stage, or did any of you think at any stage, this is ridiculous? Oh, I did, yes. Um, well, there was a time I used to get very angry when I was, I think I was nine, and I just... I was told that if you say something or thought something that he didn't approve of, he thought something. He thought something that AB or Jackie didn't approve of. Bad things would happen, and I thought, you know, and he was. My dad was treating me so badly at that point. Just, I mean, I was stuck in the house. I wasn't allowed to run a bar, and I had so much excess energy. They would get extremely angry with me because I was not able to have an afternoon nap and fall asleep because I had boundless energy. So if I ran about, I'd get punished for running about because the room I was running about in was on top of the room my dad and stepmother shared. And, but there was nowhere else to go. I was full of energy and I was running about and I used to get beaten up for running about. And it just felt so, I don't know what the word is for it. It just felt so crazy. There was just no way forward. It felt like there was no way forward. How do you do this? How do you sleep when you've got excess energy? So you, if you don't sleep, you get beaten up. If you run about to get rid of your excess energy, you get beaten up. You can't do it right. Nothing you do is right. And I got really angry at that point and I said to myself, you know, I'm going to think some thoughts, you know, so what? I'm going to think any bad things happen to me, so what? It can't hardly be worse than it is already. And nothing bad happened. And I, and I became more daring as time went on, just slowly pushing the boundaries well, as, as to in what my thought head. Well. Yeah. And nothing ever went wrong. And then my dad used to say things like, I remember in 1992, he said that would be the last Olympics because before the next one, which was meant to be 1996, I think, 
he would be the ruler of the world. And then the 1996 Olympics happened. It was like, you said that. I mean, obviously I didn't say this to him, but in my mind, it was like, you said that, but it didn't happen. You keep saying this, and something else is going on. You say one thing one day, and something very different the next. I'm sorry, this doesn't make sense. So no, I didn't believe in Jackie. If you, had, if you had said it to him and voiced those thoughts, you'd have got beaten up, would you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, right, this is the question then. The, the 1992 Olympics was not the last Olympics. Yeah. Um, Jackie, the invisible mind control machine, um, yeah. is the key question on, on religious leaders and cult leaders. Did he believe it? A very good question that is. I I may be completely wrong because you can never be you can never be sure about what someone else is thinking, but I think at first he was using it to control the people around him. And then as time went on, because everyone repeated it back to him and he was in that bubble where he believed it and everybody else did. I think he did he did begin to believe it. Maybe he didn't believe it 100%, but if you isolate yourself, I mean, we, we are not, what do you call it? We are rational, but I think we're rational in a situation. And I think if like the kind of Lord of the Flies scene where you go back to the wild, I think if you're in a situation where something is continuously in, reinforced and you already you are not a very sensible or wise person and you've got personality disorders or delusions of grandeur or whatever it's easy to fall into believing that it will it definitely is easier to believe that than to realize that you are just a has-been who no one even cares about and you think that you're so important but actually you're just a snoring and farting scrounger who has not done an honest day's work in your life who no who has no power and not even on his over his own life really do you remember him laughing your father only at people not not really about anything that i don't really remember him laughing about things except so sometimes i think there were times when he laughed about some comedy that he had watched or something and well, that was a comedy but, from the fascist state yeah but i don't know i think again as i said if he if he interacted with the outside world like even watching a film or something that kind of broke up the tension in the house mm. because it was like that that tapped into the part of him that had not become yes taken over by his own ideology the better wolf the better wolf so what happened in the end the escape yes well as I said earlier, I ran away in 2005 and that didn't work out because I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't know how to catch a train or a bus. I didn't even know how to use money or cross a road. How old were you there? 22. So I was completely like overwhelmed because I, I used to go out so... I, well, as a child, I went out about once a year. And later on, I did go out a few times but I always went with somebody and I had no way of knowing how to do things on my own because the fact is if you're stuck in four walls all the time when you go out everything is so overwhelming and I only was allowed to go out with my dad and sometimes one other person so when I was outside I was completely overwhelmed and lost by the sights, the sounds, the smells. So I just followed, if he walked, I kind of just followed behind, you know, I was told just look at you, look at his anorak and just follow. 
and so I never really learned to navigate my way around and subsequently I've learned that I've got dyspraxia so that meant it was it's difficult to not to get lost in the first place. How did he react to you having tried to escape? Well when he the, the, what happened was the police I went to the police station and the police rang the cult members and my dad came with Josie to pick me up and in front of the police he seemed really nice he hugged me and said oh how sorry he was that I had left and when I came back for the first time my stepmother hugged me before that she be barely looked at me and she treated me like some piece of dirt that had slimed up her shoes and then suddenly she was hugging me saying welcome home and it was like this is strange and I thought to myself maybe maybe they're not so bad after all but then the aggression started and he called me uh, a traitor and a, and a fascist agent in the making and that sort of thing and after that not very good fascist agent in the making. not a very good fascist agent in the making but still <laughs> for him there's still time yeah i know <laughs> for him it was a dichotomy it was always you were either a worshipper of ab or a fascist agent there was no in between you, you couldn't be just neutral hmm more echoes of religion <laughs> yeah certain religions yes um so then eventually you was it Josephine found a number to ring this was some years later eight years That's later right. yes That's well right. what happened was I never gave up hope even though my first attempt went pear-shaped I never gave up ne never gave up hope that I might be able to escape again and I was just basically looking for any opportunity to do that but I knew I needed help because I didn't I wasn't able to function on my own at that point. So what happened was in 2009, my stepmother's sister, who they were looking after, got, got some health issues and more and more chores in order to help out. But two women died, right? Yes. Two women died. Your your birth mother, Sean. Yes. Who fell out of the window. Threw herself out the window. Threw herself out. Did she throw herself out? Did you see that happen? No, but I know she was suicidal before it and she was trying to stab herself with a knife. And the other woman who died? It was O. Her name was O. She, she had been ill for a while and she kept saying that she was feeling unwell. And she was told by my dad and all the other cult members that all she needed to do was focus on AB and that's that's how she'll get well and she died of a stroke and that was another horrible scene because as she was she had the stroke and she was lying on the floor and they started demanding answers from her as to why she wasn't speaking and then and they were attacking her shouting at her saying nobody bangs their head and refuses to speak because she had previously banged her head a few minutes before and as she was dying of a stroke they were accusing her of being willful and disobedient to them for not answering their questions and all this time she could have had an ambulance there to take her to hospital which would probably have saved her life and that was going on for about an hour. There was a phone in the house, but I was not allowed to use it. I wish that I had called an ambulance, but I wasn't. I couldn't do that. It was horrendous seeing what was going on. And they just let her die, basically. And then when she died, they said the fascist state murdered her. So eventually, you were so unwell that Josephine felt she had to do something. Yes, so I started talking to Josie a lot and I said to her that do you know why I'm not allowed to go out and why things are the way they are? It's because my stepmother is so jealous of me like the wicked stepmother in Snow White. She's jealous of me and she doesn't want my 
dad to love me and things like that. And Josie sort of thought, hmm, that really makes sense. Because if I had said it was my dad as well to blame, Josie would never have got come on side because she worshipped my dad up. And then I was obviously losing weight rapidly and becoming very ill. And I think, and she thought, we, in the context that we were talking about the, the evil stepmother, that I was being allowed to to die, basically, that I'm really ill and nobody cares. Because she mentioned it to Chanda and to AB, and they just said that I am obsessed about looking good and obsessed about looking fashionable, and that's why I'm not eating and losing weight because I am like madly dieting or something. It's diabetes, wasn't it? Yes, it was, but they didn't accept that. They just thought I was choosing to eat very little so that I can look slim and pretty. What? There was a leaflet at some point, I can't remember when it was, about the Centre Point, which is a which is a organisation for like a halfway house for people who run away from home and things like young people. And I said to Josie, what I need is something like that for someone of my age. And I was 30 at that point. 30. And I said also that when Josie suggested that maybe I would go to the hospital, maybe she'd take me to the hospital when my dad and stepmother were out. And I said, there's no way I'm going to come back here. If I'm going out of this house, I'm going to be out of this house. I'm not coming back. Forever. Forever. And I said, uh, this was in 2013, I said, by the end of 2014, I'm going to be out of this situation. That was a clear possibility because of being dead rather than alive, because I was very ill. So she rang Centrepoint, I think, and they said that it was only for younger people. And I think they gave her some numbers of places where women who were facing, facing domestic violence would go, but the waiting list was enormous. And it was like, there was no way we could wait that long. So I suggested that probably what we should do is smuggle in a couple of mobile phones so that we can contact agencies who may be able to help because we couldn't use the landline as it was the bills were being paid by Chanda and she would see who was being contacted using that phone and we couldn't indefinitely go to red telephone boxes to have endless numbers of calls you know so so yeah she when she went shopping with Aisha she bought bought three mobile phones one each for us and then we kind of it was like biding our time waiting for the right thing to happen and we kind of felt like we had met a kind of a dead end and then there was this item on the news about forced marriages mm. and a helpline number was given after the item and two of us we sort of did it at the same time we memorized the number and i kind of thought this is about forced marriages and about asylum seekers or whatever and it was like that's not exactly my situation but who knows, they may be able to help. And they were. So we organised for someone to come and pick us up on the day when my dad and stepmother were out shopping because they did everything by road. If they went shopping, they would go sh shopping at 11 o'clock sharp. We managed to, we arranged for people to come and pick us up on the 25th of October 2013 and and all of that went to plan and I I was free. Uh, how long did it take for you to feel free? Um, well the, at first it was just everything was so overwhelming 
the, all the sights and sounds. It was just so, so much. What was the best thing? So many. Well, the best thing was just the ability to make choices, really, you know, have a choice and be around people who thought it was all right for me to have a preference, what about to some have an opinion. Parks and birds and cats and dogs and people. And oh, yes. I mean, yes, all of that as well. But I think I, I mean, when I was looking out of the window, I used to make friends with the neighbor's dogs and I absolutely love dogs and now I'm a pet sitter so I go around looking after other people's dogs and cats and it's kind of perfect. <laughs> yeah completely. Yeah. What was he put in prison for eventually? He got for, for it was child cruelty and forced imprisonment. Did you go to the court? Well I, I gave evidence in the trial. Look, yes. Looking at him? No, I was, I had a, it was via video link. Okay. Was that okay? Yes, yes, that was all okay. But as I said before, I am not a great believer in punishment. I do not like the notion of punishment. I... And Josephine, I understand that. Josephine spent some years trying to get him released, saying that he'd been framed by the fascist yes. state. Yes, Josie, right. who yeah. helped in your escape. I know. Is that because she loved him? Yes, and also, obviously, I do feel a bit bad about it because I did, in some ways, I did trick her because I said that Chanda was the one to blame and she could fully get on board with that. But when, when I came out and I was free, I kind of said they are both to blame and she felt that I had betrayed something. Yeah, but I've but. seen her interviewed and I've been looking at stuff mm. before speaking to you and I've seen, you know, knock on the door to get a comment and she says, you're all from the fascist state. You're all fascists. And she's living, I don't know, she's living in a different world. I think 50 years ago, when the Red Book was being pushed around the streets of London, that was, that's her world. Did I she go and see him in prison? I think she probably did. She, I don't ever remember her saying it. But she, I think, I mean, we have to respect other people's choices, even if they differ from our own. We're seeing it from a very different perspective. You're, inc you're incredible. And you are an incredible person. And I can't you. really believe that you're sitting here and you're telling me this, given what you've been through, given how you've, you've come back into the real world, wherever that is, but you know mm. what I mean? And you, the, the trauma you went through, the childhood stolen from you, the, 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 the womanhood stolen from you, and here you are now talking about it um, so, so articulately, so emotionally, intelligently, mm. so astutely. Um, mm. What a survivor you are. <laughs> Thank you. I, I credit Tolkien for that a lot because... I know people laugh at me because they think, oh, you like this stupid fantasy stuff. But Tolkien is so much more than stupid fantasy. I mean, the elves and the dragons and the wizards, that is the form. But the content is a lot more. The values of Tolkien, they're timeless, they're universal. And I think we've got a lot to learn from that. I think we've got a lot to learn from you. Thank you. I, I don't feel like I've got a lot of... Well, you're Anything a, it's to a, give. It's a, less, I, it's a lesson in survival and it's a lesson yeah. in forgiveness. Yeah. I think we should all be more forgiving and just just be kind, really. There's no need for all this fighting and aggression and ideology. and What do we need it all for? I don't know. Well, thank you so much to Katie Morgan Davis, a woman with an extraordinary moral compass learned from Tolkien if you've been affected by any of the issues discussed in this episode you can find help and support at bbc.co.uk forward slash action line for more stories of survival against all the odds can I recommend you go back to the last series and try the episode life after North Korea my interview with North Korean defector this has been